Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Welcome to this session. Um, in continuation to the previous session uh, where we discuss uh, the problem of moral hazard, how moral hazard uh, problem influence the financial structure in debt market and uh, equity market. In continuation to that, in today's session we are going to discuss um, what are the tools uh, to reduce uh, the moral hazard problem in both equity and debt market. So we have seen that uh, borrowers have incentive to take on projects that are riskier than lenders would like to because of the uh, moral hazard issues. Right. So let us go one by one what are the tools to help solve the moral hazard problem in debt contracts to begin with. One of the solution is to increase as for net worth and collateral. That means when borrowers have uh, more at stake because of their net worth, net worth is high or the collateral they have pledged to the lender is valuable, the risk of moral hazard that the temptation to act in a manner that lenders find objectionable is greatly reduced because the borrower themselves have a lot to lose. So that means these are incentive compatible. That means high net worth and collateral provide to the moral hazard problem is to say that it makes the debt contract incentive compatible. That is, it aligns the incentive of the borrowers with those of the lender. That means the greater the borrower's net worth and collater collateral pledge, then the greater the borrower's incentive to behave in the way that the lender expects and desires, the smaller the moral hazard problem in the debt contract. Conversely, also you can see that when the borrower's net worth and collateral are lower, obviously you know that there is moral hazard problem is greater because they have the borrowers have nothing to lose, uh, right? They have very little things to lose so that they will engage in more hazard problem. So here, one of the thing as I mentioned here that increase the collateral that is one and second one is also to ask is to increase uh, give loans to uh, debt to only those firms who have high net worth. Net worth means here the equity capital that is the difference between assets and uh, liabilities. So overall based on this we can see that higher the net worth and collateral the firms are having they will be having less probability or less likelihood of making default right this is one uh, option one tool and the second one is monitoring and enforcement of restrictive covenants that means that we have seen that actually the debt contracts full of more of restrictive covenants there are lots of uh, restrictive covenants so one is actually the what is meant by the first one uh, covenants what is meant by the covenants here so the covenants to discourage undesirable behavior that is one so that means the covenants can be designed to lower moral hazard by keeping the borrower from engaging in the undesirable behavior of undertaking risky investment projects so that means in the debt contract itself include all these covenants that means don't engage in undesirable uh, behavior so some covenants mandate that a loan be only used only to finance specific activities such as the purchase of a particular equipment or inventories so what is the exact purpose for which the loan is taken so it can be used only only for that specific purpose then only uh, the loan amount will be dispersed so others restrict the borrowing firm from engaging in certain risky business activities such as uh, purchasing other businesses that also uh, sometime it will be included. And second one is to encourage a desirable behavior that means for example it can encourage a borrower to engage in desirable activities that make it more likely that the loan will be paid off. So you can give one example for example uh, is that by buying insurance. 
suppose someone has taken a mortgage a mortgage loan uh, so here the thing is that the one such a restrictive covenant requires the owner of the household for example who has taken this uh, mortgage loan to buy life insurance so that he will pay off the mortgage upon the person's death so for businesses restrictive covenants of this type focus on encouraging the borrowing firm to keep its net worth high because higher borrower net worth reduces moral hazard and makes it less likely that lender will suffer losses so this is the second one and as i mentioned here the home mortgage uh, require homeowners to purchase uh, fire insurance or make monthly deposits towards payment of their property taxes so this all will be a part of the debt contract there so this kind of covenants will be included and the third one is to keep the collateral valuable so collateral valuable here means uh, because collateral is an important protection for the lender so restrictive covenants can uh, encourage the borrowers to keep the collateral in good condition and make sure that it stays in the possession of the borrower so this type of covenant ordinary people encounter most often so for example in the case of, case of automobile loan suppose if you have taken an automobile loan a vehicle loan you will be asked so often that means the require the car owner to maintain a minimum amount of collision and theft insurance and prevent the sale of car unless the loan is paid off so that means you cannot sell your uh, once you are taken your automobile that vehicle loan you cannot just simply sell this phone uh, this uh, car to other person uh, you need to complete the uh, pay off the full loan or otherwise you get the certification or no objection from the banks right and similarly minimum collision and keeping the property in good condition similarly uh, taking a mortgage a home loan there also you have been you have to keep uh, it, it would be part of the uh, loan agreement that uh, you need to keep uh, the property in good condition another thing is that uh, provide information that means quarterly accounting and income reports that means it also require a borrowing firm to provide information about its activities periodically uh, in the form of quarterly accounting and income reports so thereby making it easier for the lender to uh, monitor uh, the activities of the borrowing firm the overall objective of all these things is to reduce the moral hazard problem so all these factors which we have seen in the beginning of the uh, session i mentioned the previous session i mentioned that uh, actually uh, the debt contracts are with lots of covenants lots of restrictive practices and the why this include because in order to reduce uh, the moral hazard and these are the kind of uh, kinds of uh, restrictive covenants they include uh, in the uh, loan agreement even and even not only this i even to by uh, dispersing or releasing the installment a loan installment uh, you won't be getting suppose you have taken got a mod, uh, housing loan for example 10 lakhs uh, you won't be getting the entire amount in one go what they will do that they will be releasing it step by step that means uh, each of the uh, agreed activities in the construction of the home is completed then you will be getting uh, your installment accordingly so these are actually to ensure that the fund that you borrowed uh, was the fund that you have borrowed it will be used mainly for the purpose which is intended to use right uh, so that means it also explain the debt contracts that have numerous restrictive covenants another solution to reduce the moral hazard problem in the debt contracts is that financial intermediation so because as we said that here the fact that we mentioned discuss in just previous slide that means debt contracts involve lots of covenants because all it require constant monitoring right it all require constant monitoring suppose similarly look at the for example in the case of equity market uh, you see that it is actually difficult for each and every shareholders to monitor what how the managers are doing uh, it will be difficult and not only if a few are suppose they they think that they can uh, they are interested to monitor because they think that their, their money is in, as their money is involved their stake is involved suppose if when they keep on will start monitoring the company is working then obviously you know that there is free rider problem so at the end of the day you can see that because of free rider problem those who have been doing the monitoring 
they have less incentive to do so because others are simply free riding what the outcome of routes what because of the monitoring and actually the constant monitoring and enforcement these are costly for an individual borrower or an individual shareholder so because of that in the debt contract you can see that instead of direct finance suppose if you instead of you pay directly to a borrower uh, the lender they prefer to lend their money to the borrower through banking system or financial intermediaries because why for example financial intermediaries take the case of for, for example banks uh, you know that banks because they have the expertise in understanding the default risk and also they have the managerial and technical capacity uh, to monitor the activities of the borrower and because of that they are actually have more expertise and not only that they have the incentive to do so because they are uh, monitoring the activities of the borrower for only the, for only of those customers who have taken loans from them actually this is not traded in the market so these are private loans so there is no free rider problems on the monitoring and enforcement of banks if a bank monitor a customer uh, those who have taken private loan and the outcome actually no one is going to exploit because this is only a, for a private loan so there is no free rider problem at all on the monitoring and enforcement of banks thus uh, this is one of the reason that the moral hazard is another reason why the re existence of financial intermediaries in the financial markets so this explains that means you know, why fact number and fact number 4 so this is the summary table that explains the, the, the asymmetric problem and the tools to solve them so this is a summary table this I have taken from the main textbook Mishkin uh, textbook uh, economics of uh, money banking and financial market so here one by ones for example asymmetric information problem adverse selection problem and these are the tools to uh, resolve solve it I want to again say that we cannot completely eliminate this problem, we cannot completely solve it, we can only minimize this problem, the adverse selection problem. Still, if you look at the finance market, you can see that there are always adverse selection problems are there that is more prevalent in the finance market. And this also explains the fact number, uh, this, uh, these many fact number which are all mentioned here. So that all this for a summary. Then coming to moral hazard uh, in equity contracts, separately that equity contracts, these are the uh, tools to resolve it. Then in the debt contracts, these are the tools to minimize the problem of moral hazard. So these are the two kinds of resulting outcome of asymmetric informa information that we mentioned, adverse selection and moral hazard. And as we discussed in previous session that if these two problems are not solved or not minimized the market the finance market is going to collapse actually the complete market failure because of this market failure uh, you can see that there won't be a financial market at all so that means if there are no finance market actually you know that the growth of any economy actually is depends mostly also depends mostly on apart from other conditions depends mostly on uh, how sound uh, uh, how sound is their financial market because transferring resources from uh, the lenders who are having surplus fund to the needy people to those who can make the best use of this fund who can make use the this capital in an efficient way in order to make this flow of fund uh, we need a sound financial system for that uh, these two problems that are resulting from asymmetric information uh, that adverse selection and moral hazard, hazard it should be reduced then only we can see ensure that there is a sound financial system which would eventually lead to a high economic growth employment and increase in the standard of living of people uh, so now after discussing all these things uh, let us see that how financial development that means reduce uh, asymmetric information problem and can lead to uh, economic growth and economic development so the recent research has found that an important reason why many developing countries are still poor or their economic growth is still lagging behind experience low rates of economic growth is that their financial systems are underdeveloped that means a situation referred to as financial repression so that means these are all actually created by an institutional environment this characterized by for example one is a poor 
system of property rights poor system of property rights that means unable to use collateral efficiently so because we have seen the points that we have discussed here we have seen that in order to uh, minimize adverse selection and in order to minimize the moral hazard problem one of the solution uh, is to use collateral and net worth and you know actually in, in countries developing countries uh, the collateral actually the legal collateral the legal title to the collateral is uh, actually to some extent is, is non-existent so in order to get the legal title to their co-property or land for example uh, it is not that strong so uh, because of that you know that um, to get a loan when someone wants to take an individual he wants to take or someone a startup uh, who wants to who needs capital if he or she wants to take uh, loans from the market and uh, you know that they don't have much collateral they don't have uh, sufficient collateral even if they have collateral you know that suppose the lender and the lender will be unable to use this collateral efficiently suppose in the case of default of loan the lender cannot easily acquire the collateral of the property which is pledged by the borrower so that means poor system of property rights is prevalent uh, in developing countries that is one issue and second one is that the poor legal system uh, this also not only that there is the um, collateral the legal title to collateral is weak uh, sometime non existent uh, you can also see that the legal system uh, is also poor so the number of cases pending in the court it will be long a large number of cases still pending uh, in the courts so any suppose here because of that suppose someone um, the lender uh, who is not getting back the loan amount then you know that if he or she approaches the court uh, it will take lots of time or it will be difficult for the lenders to enforce the restrictive covenants so we have seen that uh, banks are actually enforcing uh, lots of restrictive covenants for example the borrower need to buy insurance or need in your borrower need to ensure the property in good condition what if if the borrower is not doing that so then obviously you know that uh, normally the lender uh, needs to there will be some tool actually not releasing the installment that is one however you know that if the um, uh, lender need to approach a court you know that how lengthy the process is going to and how difficult for lenders to enforce a restrictive covenants that actually this kind of issues are uh, more prevalent in country developing countries then comes actually weak accounting standards so in order to make the information clear that means revealing the uh, information honestly uh, that means the normally uh, independent auditing auditors and accountants uh, are appointed but you know that actually the accounting standards in most developing countries as the as per the research and from many reports uh, it has been shown that the accounting practices are often weak so because of that there is less access to information of the borrowers uh, of the borrowing firms and also to the about the firms who is issuing ipos equity for equity so obviously you know that all this will lead to information asymmetry and because of that you can also see that this all actually hampers the working of uh, financial market efficient working of financial market then another thing uh, you can observe that in most developing countries the government intervention through directed credit programs and state uh, owned uh, banks so for example the the state owned bank you can see that what if uh, most of the banks in a country are owned by the government then you know that when the obviously the public sector many research has, has been showing that a uh, public sector actually works le less efficiently inefficiency is one of the characteristics of public sector enterprises enterprises and here suppose the state owned bank so you know that they have less incentive to proper channel funds to its most productive use because most of the time they have to follow the order or the directives from government maybe government will be saying that uh, because government has its own priorities maybe agriculture development or some specific sectoral de uh, development then it will be asking the um, uh, state owned banks to make uh, directed credit programs maybe for uh, agriculture loan and or sometime for the small scale industries or encouraging for uh, giving loan for micro finance uh, finance units 
also so in this kind of practices or this kind of directives when the banks are getting they have to actually do all these things right they have to follow the order of uh, directives from the government so because of that what happened that because in the beginning of the course i said that the financial system ensure uh, efficient use of capital where the marginal efficiency of the capital will be high because in the if you really uh, allow more and more competition uh, and there is uh, the market financial market is very strong with the limited uh, market failure market failure is very low in that case we have seen that uh, the funds who will be uh, demanding uh, who are is borrowing or issuing uh, raising capital from the market because they find it the most productive use of those capital in as compared to those who are having the surplus capital because surplus capital most household they are having surplus capital but they know they don't know how to make the best use of it so normally this will be lent to uh, this will be borrowed by those who can make the best use of this capital so, but here you can see that because the banks are government owned so that they won't be able to make uh, a less incentive to proper channel uh, funds to its most uh, productive use and banks forced to buy you know often government the uh, go, go banks will be forced to buy government bonds and also told to lend government at short notice you know that most of the developing countries low and middle income countries uh, they are having budget the fiscal deficit that you know that fiscal deficit is nothing but the borrowing requirements for the government right so that by the end of the financial year the government uh, need to uh, fill the financial deficit and where from they borrow by borrow the money uh, mostly they borrow from uh, bond market and who are the main demanders of these bonds mostly these are by the uh, uh, banks mainly state owned banks because they are obliged to buy right so this kind of things what happened that this kind of things lead to a financial a kind of financial repression uh, in these countries and that means actually the their financial system is going to be weak so looking at this financial systems in developing and transition countries uh, face several difficulties that keep them from operating uh, efficiently in many developing countries the system of property rights which ever we discuss is function uh, very poorly so let us see this issue that the financial repression or a weak financial system how does it affect uh, the economic growth so let us take the case of china for example here uh, you know that uh, although china appears to be on its way to becoming an economic powerhouse its financial development remains in the early stages uh, you might have observed that uh, it has a weak legal system comparatively and it has a uh, poor enforcement of uh, financial contracts as per the some of the available uh, research documents uh, reports and also it has been recorded that the accounting practices in the country as compared to the western other western system they have low accounting standards just like uh, almost comparable to india as well and hard to find uh, high quality information so regulation of the banking sector uh, in its formative stages in the country so but you can obviously see that china is one of the fast growing economy in the world and is almost uh, catching up with the us economic growth so you can see that why high growth rates in the past 20 years in the Ch in china uh, is it because of the financial system or is it because of something else so what the research show that is not because of the financial system uh, is because of some other factors for example high saving rates so before that i said that though the per capita income is growing fast however per capita income is only one tenth eighth of the usa uh, however what contributed to the high economic growth or to make china uh, economic powerhouse is one actually uh, the high saving rates in the country in china uh, so you can see that there was high savings rate because of that increase in capital formation combined with the labor movement from low productivity subsistence sector to uh, the high growth sectors that is uh, manufacturing and service sectors that actually the surplus labor moved from the subsistence agriculture sector and the agrarian economy gradually transformed transformed into a uh, industry and service sector economy so actually research also showed that the uh, china's economic growth would have been even faster uh, if their financial system is also very strong so 
when we compare this one the growth story of china with of the ussr uh, because ussr was a economic superpower economic and uh, defense superpower in the 1950s and 60s so what you can see that actually when we compare these two countries example ussr shared many characteristics of the modern day china and you can see that uh, ussr case they use the scope of labor mobility from subsistence sector to the manufacturing sector uh, but you know that ussr they were unable to develop a good financial system so they have been uh, excelling in engineering and other researches uh, however uh, not much in finance research so maybe that may be one of the reason because we cannot say there are so many other factors uh, uh, social uh, political and other economic aspects but one of the reason why they couldn't become a super economic superpower one of the reason uh, is that maybe because they didn't have a strong uh, financial system so you can see here that uh, what happened in china because they understood i think uh, so not all the after the many reports is say that uh, china actually uh, learned the lessons from what happened in ussr for example because it's almost comparable with ussr uh, but uh, china you know they understood that next stage of development the the reason when you go through their uh, reports and research papers from china in the recent period you can see that there have been lots of discussion about uh, developing a robust and vi vibrant financial system right that, that means the leadership is well aware of that challenge and they have been working uh, towards that and so because of that there are recently um, you know till 1980s china was uh, almost a, a communist that means a public sector economy but they actually moved to uh, capitalist um, that a communist a capitalist communism a kind of a system where they encourage industrialization entrepreneurship and privatization and lots of banking reforms and legal reforms etc so that means we can say that maybe in the present day these days and the future maybe the their investment that the acceptance or the appreciation of the importance of a uh, strong financial system is happening in the that in china so in india uh, also you can see that uh, maybe in indian case also we can see that why one of the reason why india is lagging behind when it comes to economic growth though we say that we are, we are the fifth largest economic power uh, power economic uh, looking looking at the size of the gdp uh, india stands at the fifth when it comes to economic uh, power uh, you can see the how still you know that the per capita income of country is very poor, poor low and many people are below poverty line so one of the reason uh, may be the poor financial system and you know that when it comes to india when you look at for example we do discuss uh, bond market and uh, equity market you know that the bond market in india is relatively less developed for example at the households the households uh, where do they put their money they put their money in the bank and bank in fact put it in the bond market actually this is the household money and most households in india especially in the urban area they are less aware of the bond market in india and because of that itself you know that uh, indian bond market is relatively for many there are it is less liquid uh, because they are not well aware of how to invest in a bond market or how for example how to buy a bond treasury bill from government because not many people are well aware or even they think that is very difficult and uh, practically difficult to do so and also you can see that the, the government owned banks most of the that actually in indian banks most of the banks large share of banks in india uh, you can say that most of them are govern, government owned banks so you know that government owned banks we, we already discussed that they will be forced to uh, invest in government bonds and they were sometime often forced to lend to the government and also you know that indian bank one of the thing is that the statutory liquidity ratio is high in india for example 18.5 percent recently so they are at present that means uh, of their total deposits uh, they are uh, required to invest 18.5 uh, percentage mainly in uh, liquid assets including uh, bonds government bonds also you can see that there are increasing nps uh, non performing assets uh, you can also see that banks frauds are uh, often happening and there are lots of awareness issues uh, we also have relatively poor uh, financial uh, system etc so these are all the factors that affect um, obviously uh, maybe affecting india's economic growth
So overall in this session we have discussed uh, the moral hazard issues, how to resolve it and then we need to be applied uh, by taking insights from previous session uh, how uh, the development of um, financial system is important for uh, economic growth as well. Um, thank you.